right, so the recording is started. All right, welcome to a very regular edition of the Hyperledger Technical Steering Committee. Uh, everybody is welcome at this meeting and our other working group meetings, and likewise, welcome to contribute code. And if anybody's uncertain how to uh, act in any of these settings, you can reference our code of conduct, which is available on the Hyperledger website. Uh, today, we've got a, I think, a relatively light schedule. We've got an update from Indy first off, and then after that, we've got a continuation of the discussion on the supply chain project proposal. Uh, and then uh, a couple updates uh, that I think Tracy has here on some scheduling things and event reminders. Tracy, if you want to hit those. Okay, sure. So uh, we have some upcoming meetings that we're looking to cancel. I uh, just wanted to bring that up and, and make sure that everybody was okay with canceling the November 22nd meeting, uh, which is a Thanksgiving holiday in the U.S., as well as the December 20th and 27th uh, for the end of year holidays. Um, so just wanted to check in, see if there were any objections to that before we actually cancel them from the calendar. I, I'm fine with those. Do we want to cancel the one in December when the global forum in as, as a well, or do we want to hold the meeting? Maybe we can all get in a room in Switzerland. Good point. We probably don't have any space on the schedule for the meeting. Okay, I can add that to the list as well. It's at um, 4 p.m. local time. That would be the 13th, if I uh, have my math correct, then December 13th, we would also cancel. Well, I guess it yeah. depends what it's up against. I mean, because it is later in the day there. It's, it's mm -hmm. My distinguished colleague from France said it's 4 p.m. That's right. <laughs> Um, all right, well, why don't we take it off? Belgium. <laughs> oh, I'm French. I'm in Belgium, but I'm French. Um, why, why don't we take it offline then see if, if there's any wiggle room in the, the agenda and if, if TSC members can give maybe some indication over chat of whether they're planning on being in Basel. If we've got, we've got a quorum there and we've got some time in the schedule, it'd be good to meet face to face. Uh, and if not, we'll just, uh, we'll pop that one off the calendar as well. Sounds good. Uh, and then just <clears throat> the uh, event reminders that we've had on uh, the agenda, just the APAC Hackfest coming up the week of March 4th. Uh, we're still working on finalizing those details. And then obviously the Hyperledger Global Forum December 12th through the 15th in Basel. Okay. All right. Well, uh, I think with that, we can jump into the Indie update. I will uh, drop the, the link into Rocket Chat. And for those unfamiliar, we uh, do usually have a little background chat going in the TSC channel of chat.hyperledger.org. Okay, and uh, could somebody say again the presenter's name for Indy? This is Sam Kern with the Sovereign Foundation. Hey, Sam. You are welcome to uh, to just have people follow along with, with the link themselves, or if you want to present, uh, Tracy can release control and let you present. It's up to you. Yeah, I can share. Okay. I'm not going to do a dramatic reading of the entire thing, but uh, but I wanted to pull out some highlights. Feel free to use different voices, though. <laughs> I am no Robin Williams, that's for sure. Um, so the full update is here, and the and the and the link's been posted. Um, but the uh, but I wanted to call out a couple things. We're very happy with our progress, um, not with everything in particular, but with our with our overall progress um, uh, during this period. Um, we have the latest Indie Node release uh, rolling out this week, um, and. Uh, that's that's going out now. Uh, the BC government uh, is is expected to go immediately live with their project, so we're we're pretty excited about that. 
Uh, LibVCX has been contributed by Evernim. Uh, this is a verifiable credential library uh, to make it a lot easier to, to build that on top of the, uh, of the Indy architecture. And then uh, significant work is going into standardizing the agent communication protocol, which will help with uh, agent compatibility and, and uh, all the goals that we have there. Um, so uh, the other thing that, that I really want to call out is the, um, well, I'll get there in a second. So um, yes, uh, anyway, we've had really good involvement uh, recently. Um, our code base is up to 15,000 commits with 131 unique contributors. Um, well represented at uh, TPAC and the, uh, and the Hyperledger Hackfest um, and, and IW or other events that we, we've been to recently. Lots of interest and in, in, uh, in, in good things being received there. Um, a couple of really good things. Um, the uh, BCGov and their, in their Vaughn project, the Verifi Verifiable Organizations Network, um, has contributed code for a new sub-project under Hyperledger Indie called, that we call Hyperledger Indie Catalyst. And this is a uh, community holder uh, for credentials, which helps solve the problem um, in the supply and demand uh, equation of, of building supply with otherwise public records anyway. Um, so that's a really interesting project, and we're excited about the future of that. Um, the, the code base being contributed by BCGov is, is operational and will continue to be uh, tuned and, and, uh, and generalized to make it more, more broadly applicable. This is really useful for any, uh, particularly in government scenarios, but any situation where you have lots of credentials that you want to make available to um, to a wide group without uh, having to onboard each of those group, you know, each of the suppliers of those individually. So very cool project there, and, and it's been really good to work with them. Um, the other thing that we've been working on is the uh, is is contributing and, and organizing the work around the Indo Indie Crypto Library. Um, it's been named URSA. Um, and uh, excited about uh, about that and the, and, the, and the adoption and interest. And uh, one of our tasks coming up as, as the work on that library progresses is to now uh, convert all of our projects to use that new shared library. Um, and that's one of the things going on. Um, so uh, issues that we've been addressing um, and uh, in, in the progress there, um, there's been a lot of work around our, our, our height, uh, the Hyperledger Indie Project Enhancement uh, documents and the process there. We're still refining that process to try and figure out ways to, to, to make it flow a little easier. Um, but we've had lots of, it's been a, a sort of a central point for lots of discussions in the community, which has been great. And then uh, the, the coordination calls that we've had uh, between you know members of different organizations that are contributing has been fantastic. Uh, the Indie Agents call is particularly active as well as the Indie Overlays call uh, dealing with um, credentials decoration. So uh, really good stuff there. Um, working on a, a shared roadmap um, and, and bringing uh, members of various organizations into a, a unified sprint team um, will continue to help that. Um, the We've made a ton of progress in, in uh, testing Indie Node uh, for uh, scalability and performance. Uh, new new uh, uh, test tools there that have really let us test this at global scale, and, we, and we've really had a lot of progress there um, in, uh, and uh, feel confident in, the, in the, the, the scalability that we've been able to demonstrate, uh, which is really good. Um, uh, still more work to do there, including some uh, some things that we've identified um, that uh, that we can improve, and and so that has spawned a Ledger 2.0 discussion um, to to sort of uh, round out the scope of the next uh, the next iteration of that work. Um, inconsistent documentation. Um, we haven't made as much progress here as we've hoped, and there's a couple of complicated reasons why, um, but uh, but we we're not giving that one up. Um, in particular, we're focusing on creating both getting started guides and documentation that target uh, various audiences. Uh, we, we have people that are, are coming into the project just to see what it does and would like a demo. We have people that want to get uh, deep into the development of different uh, uh, components of Indie um, and, and producing the right getting started guides and documentation for those various audiences is, is the current focus on, on what we're doing there. Um, we're, uh, we have a proof of concept uh, um, based off of read the docs to help organize and make it a little bit easier to publish that documentation there. Um, uh, learning curve, um, we've made a lot of progress here, but it's not really ready for full publishing. Um, and, uh, but we should see significant improvement, uh, for lowering onboarding, um, uh, very soon. 
Um, lots of work in the agent community. Um, the, the thing to draw out here, we, there's lots of conversations and things going on, which is very good. Um, we have a, the beginnings of an agent test suite, which will allow uh, someone to certify their agent against this indie agent test suite um, to verify that the, that the required common levels of functionality are present and working properly. And, uh, and, and that's what we're going to leverage that going forward as we, as we uh, reach a resolution on uh, the protocol discussions, you know, things that we're doing. Um, we haven't made a ton of progress on measuring the size of the community, except for the aforementioned uh, in individual contributor counts. Um, we need to begin gathering better analytics and, and understanding the, uh, the involvement of the community in different aspects there. Um, so uh, further work that needs to be done there. Um, as far as our build issues, um, one of the, we've had some, some challenges uh, synchronizing uh, versions in, in the various builds, mostly because each of the components were building their own copies of the dependent libraries. Uh, we're migrating to a, a plan where um, each of the builds will use the most recent uh, uh, published library version uh, from the other various projects, will, which will help synchronize that around. Um, the, it, it won't be so dependent on the precise build time, uh, but will be locked to those, uh, to those released uh, library versions. Um, and we've had a little bit of struggle there. Um, we, there's still some of that work that we prefer not be directly being done by um, by uh, Evernim uh, that is still because of some of the difficulties there. And we're, and we're looking to improve that to be able to move off of a different uh, build and continuous infrastructure so that we can uh, make that more consistent. Um, in what we're doing. So um, we've got some details on releases here, um, as well as sort of overall activity um, and, uh, and then current plans. Uh, there's lots of work around agents. Uh, that's a lot less mature than the Indie Node work is. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of stuff that you'll hear, but mostly it's because we're trying to figure some of that initial stuff out. And, and Indie Node has reached a higher level of stability, of course, because of that. Um, the, the overall activity doesn't really represent in our report the amount of effort that's gone into each one. The Indie Node has received an incredible amount of effort, uh, but uh, but lots of lots of progress in the uh, in the indie agent world, which has been really uh, really encouraging. Actually, I want to call out: we have a Linux Foundation intern, uh, Kuzma, that uh, has a, has contributed significant contributions to our ongoing work with reference agents. Um, and uh, yeah, we have uh, some more details in here, including uh, including uh, links to some of the work that BCGov has been doing and um, and uh, Brigham Young University as well. Um, in their ongoing work in the community. But uh, that's my summary. Uh, if anyone has any questions, I will do my best to provide a first and intelligent answer. Hey, thanks for that update, Sam. I think, uh, I think you guys might win the, the award for most detailed quarterly reports. Appreciate having all that, that write up in there. Uh, I, I should mention that with the, the creation of this report was all, not all my work. I was just uh, voted to present. So there's others inside the Sovereign Foundation that, that put significant work towards the report. Great. I, I wanted to comment as well that I thought it was very thorough. And you, you set the bar for other projects now, which I guess, you know, could be a good thing or a bad thing. I did, I did have a question. I, I chaired a performance and scale working group. so. I know personally, I would be interested in, in learning more about the performance side of, you know, what you were doing and, and scalability tests. I don't know if some of that ties back into the test net discussions we've had in the past as well. Um, and so rather than dive into it here, I didn't know if you want to come to a performance or have someone from the team come to a performance and scale working group meeting. There are Tuesdays at 9 a.m. Eastern time. I don't know if that works for anybody or I mean, if people want to get into it here, we can, but I'll leave that up to Dan to decide. This is, uh, I'm Richard Esplin, I'm product manager at Evernim, and it was my team that was doing the performance and scalability work. Um, and we can have somebody join that. The We wrote a, a number of load testing scripts, and it took a while to get scripts that could drive the system as hard as we wanted it. <laughs> and, and then we've tuned that. We post our sprint demos on YouTube every two weeks and the last four sprints have had some section where we've reviewed the results and how we got there so if you're interested that's a good place and i can share that information with you if you want mark thanks that would be great thanks richard so, tuesday at 9 a.m eastern uh, i i can have a representative attend the next one if you'd like yeah i think 
Um, you know, as we're trying to define workloads and things, this would be great to learn from your experiences. Uh, and that, I think, leads for me to uh, a question. You, uh, you mentioned sprints just now, and uh, a little earlier you, you talked about having uh, separate teams and trying to get them into the same sprint. Uh, I wonder if you could say a little bit more on that uh, with just a, a little bit more context here that I, I think as, across different projects, I've seen projects try to maintain a single sprint across all contributors and also just have uh, completely independent sprints from, from separate teams uh, all contributing sort of asynchronously. Uh, that's a challenge uh, for all the obvious reasons, um, but it's been difficult in the community to sort of line up um, work uh, that is dependent on other things. So when when you're when we're developing a piece and there's there's a, you know some, someone's agreed to take on a chunk of work, um, you know the misalignment of schedules can sometimes delay the the future uh, the the, few, the the work that depends on that um, by by more than just a couple of days. Sometimes it's weeks before you know one uh, sprint finishes and the next one begins, and it, and it draws out the development process. And so that's made it hard. And I, I, I doubt we're going to be able to get to a, a perfect uh, level of sprint mastery here. But the goal there is to, uh, with some better community planning and goals, uh, to be able to make the dependencies a little bit more obvious. And that way teams might be able to make minor adjustments if they can in order to fit sort of an overall sprint schedule. We're, we know that we're not going to be able to perfectly align with, with all the contributors, uh, but we're hoping that better visibility into the overall plan. Um, and so the people understand what types of work are depending on the, on the, on the, on the pieces they're working on uh, will help coordinate that a little bit better. Um, mostly it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a speed issue and, and helping to, you know, to very clearly know where we are without having, you know, a whole lot of unknowns up in the air um, as we're trying to, uh, to, to make plans. That's yeah, most of the, many of the maintainers for the SDK and Andy Node are on the Evernim team at the moment. And we're trying to broaden that group so that there's more uh, variability in the cadence. But the challenge is that then we've got to own that code and fix all the bugs to support it. So uh, we're trying to figure out the right way to do that. We've tried various models. Uh, one is to invite people who we know are, are implementing something specific into a sprint with us. Uh, that happens fairly rarely because people, uh, there's not as many, other organizations aren't dedicating resources over the long term. Uh, quite the same way, we're hoping to change that. Uh, but the other approach we've had is is accepting pull requests, uh, where if it's easy, we just work it into the current sprint. But if it's a large pull request that provides a lot of review, we need to get back to them and say we're going to have to schedule this into the next sprint. And and that's been something we've struggled with. The the indie agent repository where most of that uh, new development is happening, a lot of the new uh, emerging standards. That's actually got maintainers in in both British Columbia and Brigham Young University. And it's been fun to see their collaboration together as they've tried to work to get, uh, tried to coordinate across the organization on getting the work done. And they've done some great work, but they're both sprinting separately. Uh, one's got more of a, a bigger team than the other, and so they're running at different cadences. Evernim has discussed moving to a flow model similar to Kanban in order to, to not be so rigid on sprinting and, and be more responsive to the community. Uh, it's something we're experimenting with on some of our smaller teams, and if it works out well, we'll probably move that to our indie team in order to to achieve uh, make that easier. Uh, like Sam said, to reduce that time it takes to to be responsive, so it's not on strict sprint boundaries. Okay, thanks. That uh, is interesting for for all of us operating on different projects with broad and separate teams. Yeah, and if you see things that are working, we'd love to hear the best practices. Uh, it, I, I haven't seen, every open source project seems to struggle with this uh, based on where they are in maturity. Uh, I know the Sovereign Foundation's looked at encouraging uh, organizations to sponsor developers. And if we can get enough organizations to do that, then maybe we can pull a team in a, from, from across organizations to have people working on a common goal. But uh, the scratch your own itch approach that that most open source communities follow, it, it can be it can be hard because everybody's got a different itch at a different time and, and their own priorities and trying to get those to interlock, there's a lot of inefficiency. Okay, any other uh, questions for the Indy team? Just a request 
from the identity working group. Again, similar to what uh, Mark was talking about, we need uh, closer involvement. I know that you guys are heads down building, uh, but we would like more input into the document and the, especially since Indy is the premier um, identity management system and identity uh, handling system in Hyperledger, that would be a great thing to have. Calls every other Wednesday at 12, starting, if you start next week, then you'll 12 Eastern. Perfect, we will uh, work to, to get a representative there. In the ID working group, one of the things that we would love to see uh, in the Indy project is more, we have some cross-line organizations like the, uh, like the DIF, the Distributed Identity Foundation, uh, that can also uh, participate in some of these things as well. And so one of the things that we'd like to do in the future is, is, uh, is draw them uh, more into their membership in, in, the, in the Hyperledger um, project so that we can, uh, so that we can in, uh, coordinate efforts and uh, in, in be able to share stuff there as well. Okay, great. Well, thanks for the update, uh, Sam and others on the Indy team. Richard? Our next item of business here is taking another look at the updated supply chain proposal. And if I can flip through all of the too many windows that I have open, I can drop that link into chat as well. So it's available. It's also in the agenda. So uh, I guess I'll kind of get the discussion rolling on that. We had feedback uh, two meetings ago uh, from the initial draft of the proposal that uh, largely surrounded scope, uh, looking for more detail, and then uh, discussion too on uh, where things like application boundaries come in versus platform or framework or SDK or all of the other many words that could be used to describe um, some of this software. So there's, there's a significant amount of new content in the doc uh, that was posted uh, at the beginning of this week, and we had some more follow-up uh, questions and comments from uh, Mick, Hart, Bin, and Bawa. I think those were all at least attempted to get addressed uh, before the, the meeting, uh, but with that as a little setup for it, uh, we'll just jump into additional verbal feedback. I guess the, the main question I had would be, um, last time we discussed this, um, is it, you know, you, I think you've made it clear in the document that this is not an application, but there was a question of if we go to the board with this, right, and see if this is something they wanted, or was that, am I confused? Uh, no, you, you are not confused. So, um, there is more detail in the document that might not have been apparent from the first reading and I think helps clarify some of that. Uh, there's a couple things that will be going on with the board. One is I expect some communication from uh, from the leadership uh, before the next board meeting, uh, clarifying things that, that might be germane to this proposal. Um, and then at the next board meeting, uh, this is an agenda topic, uh, not this project specifically, but uh, the, the charter, so that we have maybe a, a clear way of understanding that for future proposals. And that's uh, so, about a couple weeks out. Sounds great, thanks. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna, I'll go back and just ask my question from last time as well. And, and this has sort of been the focus of, of most of my comments on the paper on the proposal for it. Um, can you help me understand um, where this project ends and where the application begins? Um, when, when you think about the components, 
um, um, there's lots of nice words like reusable data types and other things like that. How do you see those being um, constructed in a way that doesn't bleed them into what we consider application space? Yeah, uh, and I think uh, the the other proposal contributors are free to, to chime in here, but the way that I think about it is there's going to be uh, example use cases that inform the design uh, as we do sort of you know the traditional analysis of what are the the data components that that are common across these these use cases and we look at the the applicable standards and so forth that are going to define what those data structures look like and formats and types and all that you know, we think about what does an application mean in in blockchain well that gets to be a little bit of a, a philosophical question, but one way you could look at it is what's the uh, the user surface? So when you've got somebody who's who's actually trying to transact with the system, they might have a uh, client uh, CLI, they might have a, a web app that they're interfacing with the system, they might have um, other back-end systems within their company that want to integrate up with this. And so those things aren't the focus of this project. This project is mostly to help facilitate making those things easier. So if somebody wants to be able to um, compose a few operations in a supply chain that might, um, say, uh, divide up some resource and then uh, re-aggregate that and other components into some, some new product, those kinds of operations should be clear and straightforward using this set of libraries, set of data types. Um, so, it wouldn't. I mean, that's that. Um, that still sounds very generic, right? Um, it, it, maybe a better way to approach this is, you know, Sawtooth already has um, kind of a sample app that that's the trace and tracking um, with a couple of things related to that. W which of the modules do you expect out of that? Um, will be part of the platform, and which of the modules would you consider sort of sample or demonstration capabilities for this project? I think one concrete example would be the uh, the interface for for track and trace for the the web app of it. Um, we did versions of that that were focused on fisheries, and then uh, a more generic one that you could do like airplane part tracking and um, one of the contributors made the observation that there really wasn't a need to, to recode those interfaces each time if you had a, another abstraction. So one of the links that you'll see inside this proposal is to a uh, uh, client, uh, let me see if I can find the right words for it. It's the uh, universal uh, client RFC. Uh, the RFC is where that universal client is defined, but that would be an example of something that's inside this uh, this project. This idea of having something that's uh, that you could easily generate more specific user interfaces with, but those specific user interfaces wouldn't be the focus of this project. We might include some as instantiations as as examples. Uh, but those wouldn't be the the core goal. More so would be the the goal of making it easy to generate those kinds of things. And those changes were put in just late yesterday, right? Because I haven't had. A, I mean, I looked and saw some of the new links, but I haven't had a chance to really review it. So, um, the links so, went in on Monday. Yeah. Okay. Um, what is the, again, the, 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 that seemed to be focused on what's kind of not in. Um, uh, are you expecting to describe and prescribe data types for things, widgets for components, for composability, um, for location, for ownership? I mean, what, again, I'm just trying to figure out what what is... If Acme Corp comes in and uses this, what is it that you're providing and what are they building on it? Um, clearly the, the sort of web, you know, the logoed web front end is out of scope. 
um, mm -hmm. are they giving you a specification for a for an asset for representation of an asset or are you giving it to them I, th I think uh, I think you could say that we would give one possible implementation that may conform to existing specifications that they already use in their uh, legacy or current state environments like asset definition is something that their PFS systems if it's like a fixed asset or physical asset that their PFS systems or uh, other types of uh, asset or manufacturing or logistics systems would be managing today and like there are industry standards for asset frameworks just as an example uh, and like implementing those as a as a protobuf in line with primitive definitions that have also been established uh, as part of this so like this is how we all agree that we will handle booleans for example uh, would be a, a serve as a potential starting place uh, or as a wholly reusable component in whatever application they're ultimately building So like defining defining a data model for asset uh, and then so that everyone who wants to build something that tracks assets in a supply chain doesn't have to rebuild that from scratch especially if it's grounded in an existing consortium or industry specification is the uh, is the intent here I mean, you could like things that I don't know that we're like we're looking at immediately, but we're certainly aware of is uh, like there's a new open data initiative uh, with between Microsoft, SAP, and I think Adobe, and they're going to define some core reusable shared data models that are just going to be open. And so implementing those open data models for things like a customer, just as an example. Uh, might be something that could be contributed to a supply chain uh, framework such that uh, people that want to deal, you know, deal with customer entities, customer things, customer nouns uh, on a supply chain could just, it, rather than everyone having to re-implement that, that doesn't make it an application. What that makes it is like an includable component in whatever app you're building. There are plenty of other industry specs and like the right way to manage the library of conformant nouns uh, will be something that the project will have to consider. So I think um, another general area, so there was a lot of good specifics in that, but you know, if we think across, you know, what, what might other projects in Hyperledger want to be considering some of the feedback that I heard ahead of this proposal was that when when developers come to Hyperledger there's not a whole lot of individual libraries and reusable components there's a lot of uh, scaffolding that that each of them has to rebuild um, I don't think it's too much of an overstatement but one of the you know I think a lot of the experience with coming to one of the platforms is that all right there's there's a very primitive key value pair you know that might be instantiating different styles uh, across the different platforms but there's not a whole lot of uh, higher level data types and models that are already prepared for them and so this would be uh, this is one uh, set of, of areas that that would be uh, value provided by this kind of project that here's some here's some scaffolding that you don't have to create when you're going after a supply chain project. It's, it sounds like some of this um, is sufficiently generic to be useful uh, outside of supply chain when we talk about uh, standards around key value pairs and, and generic assets, which there definitely is, I think there is a carve out for that within the, the sort of uh, abstractions that we tend to use when we're working on a blockchain. Um, 
yeah and just remark leads me but yeah and i i don't know if you're reacting what i was just saying but what i was saying was that that very most generic key value pair uh kind of primitive that's mostly what's available to developers that come to hyperledger right now and so this would be an effort to get get uh, more scaffolding above that That makes sense. So as part of the effort of uh, integrating some of the functionality that was part of Composer into Fabric, we're actually going beyond that, right? I mean, we have this notion of transactions and assets that are being developed, but it's all based on, I mean, it's all very generic still, right? It's to define a contract, a transaction, you know, that kind of that level which is still much lower level than I think what you're talking about. And so I, practically speaking, do you guys, can you tell me, I mean, what are the, what are you going to, to actually produce? I mean, is it just like data format kind of things? Like, you know, what is an asset? What kind of transactions you can have on these assets? And, how do, I mean, practically speaking, how do I, you know, if I wanted to use this with Fabric, what do I get, really? Yeah, so I think if you wanted to use this with Fabric, there's at least two, actually probably three pieces that, that come into play. Uh, one is the, the contract libraries will be built, uh, at least initially, uh, focused on WASM. Uh, I don't know for certain that they would never extend outside of that, but that would be sort of the narrow waste where uh, if Fabric, uh, you understand from talking at, talking with uh, secondhand uh, people speaking with Chris at uh, uh, not this past Hackfest, but the one before that there's interest in adopting Wasm interpreter. That would be one place where you know, if that coupling is there, then you're pretty much good to go. And then the other two things sort of follow from that, that there's the, the data models, data types, uh, and then uh, potentially this uh, universal uh, client generator. But all of these things, I mean, when you say, even if we, if we implemented a, a WASM shim for Fabric's chain code, I doubt this would be enough to you know, run whatever smart contract you guys are developing based on, I don't know what model of chain code or smart contract. I mean, as you know, I mean, you know, one of the things that puzzles me in this whole thing is it presumes that somehow we have a level of interoperability or portability from one platform to another that just doesn't exist at all today. And I yeah, don't know I, how you make that reality. I, I think that's a very good point. Um, and I think it's, it is, it's definitely relevant to be thinking about WASM here. Um, uh, I think, uh, I mean, I was thinking about this in the context of, of Burrow and one, one thing that got my arm with the Ethereum community is they are talking about, to a subset of, um, uh, hello. Is that someone trying to get in? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know. We get think somebody's got their phone too close to the microphone. Oh, uh, right. Um, uh, so yeah, uh, Ethereum moving over to some form of WASM, but if you, let, let's put aside for one, one moment that we don't have that quite yet, although we've got Sabre and Sawtooth, it's interesting to hear that Fabric thinking about that. There's, there's two areas where you can imagine uh, putting in a hook for, so there's the, there's the layout on, uh, within, within WASM of certain data structures. There's also, if you look at the way that WASM integrates with the browser, um, you get uh, kind of callback, so you call it a particular address, like a special reserved address. Uh, WASM doesn't make any assumptions about what the layout is of the call for that is, but you could imagine, for example, if you had a uh, like packaging uh, function that describes how an asset is packed, you could imagine hooking that in, and you could kind of get a collection of sort of supply chain opcodes almost, um, which would be kind of interesting. But I agree that. Uh, some of this does seem to pre presuppose that we, we have a, a better level of portability um, between the projects, but it would be nice to have that for sure. Yeah, I think uh, it doesn't necessarily presuppose as much as it helps march us in that direction. 
these things can be kind of a chicken and the egg problem. So, uh, you know, I think that we could look at this project as, as one way to help move that dialogue forward. Okay, but so then I, you know, I would like to know who's committed to, to work on this other than on Sawtooth. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? You got air horned. Yeah, sorry. We have some soccer supporters or something in the project. <laughs> um, I, I was yeah. going to ask, I mean, who is, who is, I mean, who is committing to supporting one more, more than one platform in this particular project? Because, you know, I, I'll be honest with you, as you know, I mean, we have had, and, you know, I, I'll be honest with you, I share, you know, I give presentations at Hyperledger all the time. And I always have this slide with the Embrita stuff, right? And I talk about all the frameworks and I say, and then we have this layer of different tools and technologies that are supposed to be platform independent, framework independent. And, and then, you know, when people ask you, you always have to, well, yeah, this only works with fabric. Oh yeah, this only works with fabric. And this, yeah. So, and and I, I find, you know, this a bit annoying and I hear you specifically, Dan, I mean, for instance, you quite rightfully, I think, ask people, when are you going to support Sawtooth or some other, uh, or some other framework? And, and the reality is we can't force people to do what they don't want to. And I, I start questioning the approach we have at, at the TSC level when we endorse these projects that are meant to be platform independent when they really are not just because even if they could potentially be, in reality, there's nobody who's going to do the work. And you could argue, well, it's a chicken and egg issue, but experience shows that it doesn't really work to put that card before the horse. Unless we have people who say, yeah, I'm actually going to work on making sure they support this other platform too. I don't think we can bet on the fact that is somehow people are going to show up to do the work. Yeah. When I, when I think about that problem, I, I kind of think from layers underneath with, with projects like Explorer, uh, when somebody comes to the community, it looks like, all right, here is a tool that is meant by its actual um, charter and so forth to support all of the platforms and, and, and represent it that way. Um, I think, you know, a, a different view of that is, is what's happened with Burrow, where uh, Sawtooth contributors saw value in having this kind of interpreter and, and everything that it brings with it. Uh, it worked pretty readily to integrate that in. Fabric saw that same value and contributors there looked to, to bring that in. So, uh, you know, one way we could look at, at the supply chain project is that, hey, this does seem to have value. Well, we're going to find resources to integrate this on or, you know, that's just a project that's waffling around out there. That's not worth, that's not worth our time. Yeah, but there's a big difference, right? Because Burrow in and of itself can stand, right? Mm -hmm. And and we have similar now, you have integration with Indy and stuff like this, but it's the same. They, they, it, it, it's not its own. it doesn't have any dependencies. And then we can have these integrations, which I, I you know, I'm sure everybody thinks this is a good thing to have. And I definitely want to keep encouraging this. But this is a different beast because, and again, by the way, my opinion on whether this is in scope or not has not changed. I don't think, I just really don't see this in scope at all. I didn't expect us, meaning Hyperledger, to get into that realm at all. But put that put aside, you know, it, it, it's a different layer, at least we can agree to that, whether it's in scope or not. It sits on top of something else, you know, it cannot stand on its own. So, it's very different from the situation you described it with. Okay, uh, I see Vipin's hand raised. Yeah, uh, just want to step back a little bit here. Um, so, you know, first of all, there is this avoidance of the third rail, which is the application concept. Then there is this whole thing about 
abstractions, data, data abstractions, other kinds of abstraction, interaction abstractions, which are generic, like many people said, including Silas and uh, Arno. So we have the tension between these two approaches, right? I mean, so the, the, the point is that uh, by taking an example project like supply chain, you might stimulate uh, development in all of those different areas and also on stuff that is using those uh, abstractions to create other primitives that may be reused elsewhere, but also uh, building higher and higher up the stack until you have, you know, something that is could be uh, reused for, uh, you know, I mean, concentrating purely on the supply chain stuff, for example, there are standards around bills of lading, around uh, various documents that are present in supply chain. And, uh, you know, those are well-established standards. Uh, now, the primitives that operate on those standards, like, for example, the uh, atomic elements that are operate in those standards may not be as well specified, but still. So if something is going to be built layer by layer like this and uh, released as separate libraries, then they could be very useful. As to whether it would interoperate with different uh, different DLTs, you know, uh, I have to disagree with Arno that there are, um, like Caliper, for example, is attempting to do just that, to interoperate with different ledgers. And they have already established some methodology for doing that. Maybe we can learn from that. So the whole point is, you know, don't knock this as a purely application level thing, because without uh, without use, you know, this this whole thing becomes, you know, uh, like just saying that we, if we are only on the bottommost layer, then uh, you know people come to this and say, how can I use this? And it requires like five months of work in order to get it uh, get anything useful going. So. Uh, to have things built on top is al always a good thing, especially if it's designed uh, with a, you know wider uh, usability in mind, both in terms of the number of DLTs and also in terms of the use cases. That means not just supply chain, but you know something else like a payment system, because some of the supply chain stuff, uh, like you know trade finance use cases could uh, benefit payments. Uh, so there is a lot to be said for the, all that, but you know, again, coming back to the resource issue, uh, you have to think uh, deep and hard about all this, but I wouldn't stand in the way of something like this getting incubated, uh, even though you know, people would say, oh, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, map well with the charter, but the charter is written in 2015, and it's now 2018. So maybe the charter itself needs to be revisited. I don't know. Okay, but that's the boards to decide, right? <laughs> We're only here to implement it, not to redefine it. But oh, that's not that's not true. I don't know. <laughs> we, the, the, we have a say in it too. We and and we've already done that. I, you know, the things like Explorer, I think, are another are another example of things that sort of cross that. Um, or sitting at least right on that that edge there. So I, I I don't I don't feel badly about having the discussion um, uh, here in the TSC. Um, I I do think that we're conflating a number of different issues here into one discussion, and it might be good to to pull these apart a little bit. I think issue number one is uh, what does the charter really say, um, and what are we supposed to do. Um, it, thinking about applications again, I you know personal opinion. I think that thinking about applications that enable broader use of blockchain in this space and the hyperledger's role in that is an interesting discussion and one we should have. Um, whether or not they need to sit as projects in the same vein as Fabric and Sawtooth and Rohan and 
all the others. That that's for the board to decide, not me. Um, a second issue that's coming up, I think, are the very specific details of the proposal. And and again, I will say. I'm not comfortable with the level of specificity in the proposal at this point as to, um, again, I'd have a hard time saying which parts of that proposal are specific to supply chain and which if I just lifted that text up and said some other application domain would, would continue to be valid. So I have some very specific issues about um, the details in the proposal that, that I'm still not comfortable with. The third issue um, is one that that we come back to over and over again, which is we like to claim cross-platform for these sort of um, component operations, but it's been very difficult to actually realize that in any real sense. And um, as Arno was pointing out, I think we need to kind of go one of two ways on that. One is, is that we better make sure that there are commitments ahead of time for any of these things to claim to be cross-platform. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, and make sure that the commitments are there before we start, or we just drop that requirement. Um, uh, and if we're going to apply that criteria going forward, we need to also apply that criteria looking backwards and make sure that the rest of the projects that claim and were approved with some assumption of cross-platform are actually demonstrating the commitments um, to do that. So I, I, I'd like us, if we possibly can, to pull these out into three separate things because pushing them together, it, it doesn't feel like we're making much progress um, in, in getting any clarity on this. So I, I, my request is we focus on the specificity of the protocol of the proposal um, because a lot of those other things are separate discussions that are much broader than the proposal and we should tee them up um, for, part of, for part of our TOC discussions. Okay, so uh, quick reactions to those. I think your, for your third point, the, the commitment from this project is to uh, build everything behind the WASM interface. So anything that's implementing WASM, that's, that's sort of the uh, requirement for, for this project. It's not intended to be anything sawtooth specific or fabric specific or anything like that. It should all be shielded behind that WASM interface. So, uh, so, second so then point. why don't we make, so then why don't we make this proposal about a generic WASM interpreter comparable to the borough EVM capability? Well, it's, it's more than that though, because it's, um, it's also trying to address those supply chain operations. Um, uh, and then to that specificity, uh, I would ask you to do, please take a look at the additional content that was added. Um, there's links and sometimes people uh, eyes glance over that there's links, but there's actually some design documents backing this that I would think are at least as specific, if not more specific than other proposals we've seen. So, yeah, I think there are some useful, having looked at the RFC, that, that clarifies to me a little bit uh, better what this would be about. Um, I, I like your breakdown there, Mick, in terms of the different issues. Um, I think that uh, the idea of it being a generic WASM interpreter would not be quite right. I think uh, WASM standards as the, as the structured uh, output of the project in terms of what, what tech it actually produces is kind of in the right direction. Um, I might suggest that we could look up one higher level. Um, there's some work on a thing called Web IDL, which is an IDL a la Protobuf IDLs that has some ongoing work that, that, so you, that, that can generate WASM, which is a fairly low level um, structure, not, not entirely an interface that you'd want for the level of describing supply chain data types. Web IDL, um, like I say, it has integration hooks that can be generated, generated uh, code and has some support in, I think, uh, some interpreters, but you can, you know, uh, have generic lists and it's data definition language. And I think that uh, perhaps, I, I also agree that, the, that we need to hold projects to account or drop the, the requirement that they are really cross project. I think asking something like this to uh, own future integrations into projects uh, is probably a bit much. I think there needs to be some organic interest from contributors and the community of those projects to do the integration. But I would like to see maybe, as this is a somewhat trailblazing um, proposal and project, if, there, if the output of this was some form of IDL or uh, maybe we could flesh out what we mean about the WASM, then that would be a way of meeting in the middle. So it wouldn't be specific to Sawtooth. 
and it would it would produce some some data artifacts that, that other projects could look to uh, to generalize. So, for example, you know, web IDL, it would be possible to potentially ge generate uh, EVM code from that. Um, it'd be potentially possible to generate other things. Um, so that seems like maybe a nice compromise. Okay. Well, thanks. I think that's a good uh, note to end on. We are out of time here. Uh, we'll try to assemble some some notes out of this discussion, and we will uh, uh, hear everybody next Thursday. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, all.